Um, I'm Jim Overdahl, and I'll be the moderator for this panel on, on banking reform. And of course, banking reform is part of uh, many of the sessions today. Uh, but we'll focus on uh, uh, some specific aspects of it. And of course, what has led us to uh, bank reform in Dodd-Frank? Um, you know, Gary Gorton had the uh, wonderful uh, essay entitled Slapped by the Invisible Hand. Uh, that's, that's one explanation of what happened. Uh, it seems to me that what we experienced during the crisis was not a George Bailey problem, although we may have benefited from having a few more Mr. Potters around. Uh, it was not a run on retail deposits, like during the Great Depression, but an institutional bank run which is one of the things that we'll talk about here this afternoon in, in runs on repo, uh, prime brokerage runs, and uh, runs on money market or, or prime money market mutual funds. Um, and of course, this process then has led to Dodd-Frank. Now, this is not original to me. I've read this in the Wall Street Journal a while back where someone likened the, Dodd, the process that created Dodd-Frank to a barroom brawl. And of course, the important thing about a barroom brawl is that you don't hit the guy who started the fight. You hit the guy you've been meaning to hit. <laughs> and it, it seems to me, having been, having been around in Washington for many years, that I, I saw this process a lot in Dodd-Frank, because there were many, many issues uh, that Dodd-Frank addressed that did not appear to have much at all to do with the financial crisis, but did appear to have a lot to do with longstanding grievances on all sorts of matters, and um, uh, including things such, of course, you know, conflict minerals, other things that uh, maybe were not central to uh, the financial crisis. Uh, so our panel today uh, will lead off with uh, uh, John Walsh, uh, who is a leader in the financial regulation practice at McKinsey & Company. Uh, prior to joining McKinsey, uh, John was the acting controller of the currency uh, between 2010 and 2012. Uh, most notably for this conference, he is a Notre Dame alumnus. And in the beginning of this process, mentioned that with the last name Walsh, he was used to going last. So I thought those two things combined is Notre Dame affiliation. And uh, we'll give him a chance to go first here today. Uh, his career has taken him from the Peace Corps to, the, to OMB, to the Treasury Department, to Capitol Hill, where he served on the staff of the Senate Banking Committee, to the Group of 30, and finally, uh, in 2005 to the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, where he served as Chief of Staff before becoming Acting Comptroller. Uh, he's no stranger to financial crises, having had up-close seats to uh, uh, both the SNL meltdown uh, and, and most, the most recent uh, financial crisis. Uh, An Anjan Thacker will go next. Uh, Professor Thacker is the John E. Simon Professor of Finance at uh, the Olin School of Business at Wash U in St. Louis. Uh, Wash U is just the latest stop in a long and distinguished academic career that includes previous stops at the University of Michigan, Indiana University, Northwestern University, and UCLA. He's published several books, many scholarly articles in banking, financial institutions, uh, financial intermediation, and corporate finance, uh, and has done extensive executive education and consulting work uh, as well as appearing an expert witness in many federal cases involving ga uh, banking litigation, and uh, earned his PhD in finance from Northwestern University in 1979. And finally, Anil uh, Kashyap is the Edwards uh, Eagle Brown Professor of Economics and Finance at the University of Chicago, Booth School of Business. Uh, his research has won him numerous awards uh, focusing on banking, business cycles, corporate finance, uh, monetary policy, uh, he has spent time at the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve uh, and has also served as a consultant to the, or serves as a consultant to the Federal Reserve uh, Bank of Chicago and, is ser and serves on uh, advisory panels of uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, uh, NBER. Uh, he's a member of the Squam Lake Group and uh, serves on the International Monetary Fund's advisory group on the development of the macro prudential policy and earned his PhD in 1989 from, um, uh, from MIT. Um, and finally, academic conferences like this in Washington, I think, are vital. There's a, a long pent-up demand for uh, research to help guide our decisions. 
this is from the, the mall, the National Mall uh, here in Washington uh, during the John Stewart, uh, uh, Stephen Colbert uh, rally, uh, the Keep Fear Alive rally. And I thought it was a, an appropriate uh, uh, way to try to integrate our, uh, the academic work that we're, that's being presented here today with uh, some of the, uh, the, the issues before us. So with that, John, why don't we get you up here? And let's see. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm the non-academic at the academic conference uh, and uh, have been working at McKinsey now for just about nine months, uh, basically trying to help uh, clients, not just banks, kind of understand what it is that they should be doing to uh, adapt to the new regulatory environment that uh, that has been created. Um, I, I like Jim's introduction, the very sensible, you know, address actual problems, develop uh, uh, responses based on sound evidence, and then implement them with uh, appropriate review to ensure that the, the solution fits the problem. Uh, but this is Washington, and that's not the way we do it. Uh, major financial reforms following a crisis, and I've now observed this several times, uh, tend to be developed in, in quite a, a fever. And they're uh, actually, in the legislative process, they're often finalized in marathon all-night sessions in which the participants uh, are deeply sleep-deprived. Uh, and, and then the conclusion is reached at 4.30 AM and sent off to be prepared as legislation. And, and the results can be quite chaotic. Legend has it, uh, after the savings and loan crisis, that the, the legislation that went to the White House actually had the name and phone number of a lobbyist in the enrolled bill that was sent to the President to be signed. And uh, that had to be taken out later uh, in the subsequent technical corrections bill that always follows. But politics being what they are these days, I think a particular feature of this legislation is that uh, it was very difficult because of partisanship, I think on both sides of the aisle, to have very sensible discussions of how to deal with the issues. So people tended to find kind of one-sided solutions uh, to, to put into place. And that same political dynamic has made it very difficult to do even what would normally be uh, a the typical sort of technical corrections and, and kind of fix up things where, where there are problems. Uh, that hasn't stopped the debate, however. Uh, so, you know, now several years after the passage of Dodd-Frank, with many rules still to be written, there's still a raging debate over too big to fail. We just heard Tom Honig uh, talking about a, a quite an alternative formulation uh, of what the banking system should look like compared to uh, either what it does look like or what is actually embodied in the, the new laws that are and, and rules that are being put into place. So what I'm going to do is set the scene, describe what Dodd-Frank did, where we are in implementing it, uh, and then my fellow panelists, both uh, in these next minutes and over the next day or so, uh, will uh, we'll talk about whether we got any of that right. And uh, so. We, we uh, at McKinsey spend a lot of time talking to bankers uh, both about what they need to do to, to deal with the new regulatory environment, but also figuring out what they are doing. And uh, just by way of, of a few illustrations, if you, look at, uh, if you look at the laws that were written, they kind of changed the world in the Depression. They were these neat, tidy little documents. That, uh, that kind of stated what should be done. I mean, Dodd-Frank went to thousands of pages. The rules that will be written will be many thousands of pages more. So it's a much more complicated process. Some of that is to do with passage of time and a more complex world. Uh, but some of it is to do with the fact that we just specify a whole lot more about what we want institutions to do. And alongside the expansion of rules and rulemaking is the fact that, that uh, banks and other institutions are asked regularly to report volumes of information uh, that they never did before. So the, the volume of reporting that goes on is, is multiples 
larger than it used to be, and this only refers to things like required reporting in, in Fed reporting forms. It's also true that regulators now ask the bankers to deliver granular transaction level, loan level data on their mortgage portfolios, their credit card portfolios, their home equity loan portfolios. So it's, uh, it's actually quite a huge uh, undertaking uh, to, to kind of keep up with the demands for information, which then begs the question of, of how do you use that information effectively to do useful things both about evaluating the safety of the system and thinking about how the institutions work. And of course, the, the, uh, the, the kind of natural outcome of that is that uh, CEOs and boards and others spend a great deal of time thinking about regulation, certainly many more times than they did before. And some of that is, is to do with the fact that we are post-crisis, so you have to work through the, the, the set of new rules and kind of readjust to the new environment. But it has also, I think, created a bit of a step change uh, in the way that these things happen. And there are three sources, three fronts, uh, from which this regulation has come. Uh, there is the international agenda. So we had a, a crisis that one could well argue began in the United States, was triggered in the, in the subprime sector in the United States, and, and transmitted through uh, structured finance uh, and the, the leverage that it created. But it was also international in character. So there was a, an international response, both the uh, I, I don't think that the Financial Stability Forum was created in the crisis, but it became the Financial Stability Board, a, uh, a representation of 20 of the largest economies coming together. And then the Financial Stability Board, both in concert with and giving direction to the Basel Committee and EOSCO and some others, uh, then directed a whole set of, of international uh, agreements to put in place higher capital, the liquidity framework, and the other things that, that tend to be uh, summarized under the title Basel III. And then country by country, there was national rulemaking to implement both the international agreements and to do the additional things that were considered necessary country by country. And I would say, uh, without fear of contradiction, that the largest uh, of those undertakings is Dodd-Frank in the United States. And then a third piece that always follows a crisis, but I think has been particularly marked in this case, is that there is a great deal of regulation, uh, specific regulation, changes in the way business is done, as well as uh, penalties and other things associated with it coming out of the enforcement process. And a lot of that is enforcement of laws that are not new from Dodd-Frank. But for example, pre-existing laws that dealt with uh, dealing with customers, uh, uh, proper handling of mortgages, the foreclosure process. And so there's actually quite a, a, a huge amount of change that has come through the enforcement process. But if we go back briefly to the international agenda, we have the Basel III recommendations, uh, which have, as has been mentioned already, focused on capital, liquidity, both short, time, uh, short term and longer term. And the, the capital, basic capital requirement in, in Basel III changes in several dimensions. One is there is a tighter definition, more of a focus on, on tier one common equity. Uh, tighter definition so that some of the flakier things, some of the hybrid capital instruments that didn't stand up very well in the crisis are ruled out of the calculation. And the denominator has been expanded to include a wider range of risk-weighted assets and the weighting of assets, especially things capital market activities, uh, have, been, have been given a heavier weighting. So there have been changes made in several dimensions, tighter numerator, bigger denominator, heavier weights on, on certain of the risks. And in addition, uh, under the old regime, in effect, tier one common only needed to be about 2%. I mean, you could lever 50 to one uh, against tier one common under the old rules, although banks tended to hold more than that. That has now been increased to a base of seven, in effect. And for the systemically important institutions, another one to two and a half percent added on top of that. So this is quite a substantial change. One can argue, as was argued already today, that that's not enough. But it is, uh, it is quite a significant change based on what went before and would put capital levels substantially higher than those 
that banks like J.P. Morgan Chase and others who came through the crisis uh, quite well uh, held on their books uh, at, the, at the time of the crisis. It is also worth noting in the little block to the right there that in fact Basel III is of course not in effect anywhere fully. The United States has never adopted the Basel II models-based approach for sophisticated institutions. It's never actually taken effect in any bank in the United States. So it's the, the stress test that the Fed conducts that is actually the binding constraint and is actually a very, very tough capital constraint that U.S. banks have to meet and certain foreign banks operating in the United States and other countries are doing their own versions of liquidity requirements, ring fencing and other things. The, the Swiss in particular have the so-called Swiss finish where they uh, have pushed up capital levels to quite substantial levels. Uh, it, it is also worth noting, I mentioned that in, in Basel, uh, in addition to the fact that there was an expansion of the international framework from the kind of G7, G10 countries to G20, there was also an evolution where the rules set in Basel don't just apply to large internationally active banks, uh, which was the, the old format, uh, but that they now apply effectively to all banks in some form or another and across all countries. So we have an expansion along several dimensions in that way and as is indicated here, it's just a slide that talks about a rather elaborate set of proposals to do with risk aggregation, risk IT systems that banks are expected to maintain if they are systemically important. So it, we, we've had changes in, in many directions. Turning to the U.S., we have Dodd-Frank, which has uh, introduced reforms of many kinds. There, there are institutional reforms, and that includes uh, an expanded role for the Fed in bank holding company supervision, a much more kind of expansive, intensive approach that they're expected to take. Their responsibility for non-bank, uh, systemically important institutions, which will come out of the, the FSOC process. We have the FDIC with a much expanded role for orderly liquidation and more involvement in the affairs of the largest banks. We have the creation of the FSOC, which was mentioned, uh, to try to uh, keep an eye on the wider range of risks in the system. We have a new consumer bureau. And in addition to the institutional changes, we have a set of restrictions and controls on what activities can be undertaken and how they can be undertaken, so the Volcker rule, uh, additional counterparty credit limits, supervision of OTC derivatives, which you'll talk more about, push out of derivatives, the reliance on central counterparties, retention of securitization. Then we have, again mentioned by Tom Honig, the resolution and recovery process with living wills. And one of the implications of this focus on the process of devising a plan to resolve large institutions uh, has been, as a sidelight, more of a national approach to supervision with, with uh, ring fencing uh, around assets in individual countries. Capital and liquidity we've seen and a, and a whole range of, of costs that have shifted uh, to the large banks. The, the rulemaking is far from complete. So we have about two-thirds of the rules that have been put out in uh, either uh, final or proposed form, uh, another significant chunk to come, although they don't tend to be the kind of big ticket items that we've worried about. But during 2013 or, or the early part of 2014, we expect a whole set of additional rules that will come online that will significantly affect the economics of banking, and those include finalizing the capital requirements, Volcker, securitization, derivatives, uh, and we've just seen uh, the, the first of the new rules come out of the CFPB for mortgages. There is also the dimension in the U.S. in particular of a complex process. I only mentioned the OCC here and then Consumer Bureau and State Attorneys General, but if you just look at the prudential side of the House, the U.S. has the OCC, the Fed, and the FDIC all pursuing prudential regulation of banks. Those same, especially the large banks, are also subject to the Consumer Bureau, looking much more intensively at their retail and consumer activities. But the prudential supervisors are not entirely moved out of that space either. And then you have the state attorneys general that, particularly in the context of some of the mortgage and credit card activities, have been themselves quite active and aggressive. Uh, 
Uh, I don't mention the market regulators who also factor in the SEC and the CFTC. And when it comes to rulemaking, I can assure you that if a single agency has to write a rule, they get to it pretty directly. If the three banking agencies have to write a rule, they all speak the same language. They kind of eventually get there when they work out their differences. If you have rules like some of these securitization rules, Volcker and others, where you need the market regulators, the banking regulators, and sometimes the Federal Housing Finance Agency or others, they approach the things differently. They need different kinds of rules. They need them to apply to in the bank supervision or create broadly based market rules, it is just very, very challenging to do, which is one of the reasons that, that some of these rulemakings have taken such a very long time, even where there are not substantial differences of view about the outcome. And then there is an element of regulatory competition, especially on the enforcement side of things, where you, you wind up having both more agencies uh, involved in the rulemaking and then also kind of battling it out a bit to see who can be the toughest. Finally, uh, to, to turn to the enforcement piece of things, and just to give you a bit of a flavor, the foreclosure robo-signing, I mean, it seems like ancient history, but, but a few years ago, uh, the idea that foreclosures were being filed without proper documentation, uh, filings were being made in court or before administrative law judges that had been improperly prepared, that resulted in a huge range of mortgage consent orders against the 14 largest mortgage servicers, which also translated into the uh, enforcement action or the agreement reached with the attorney generals for $25 billion worth of relief. So it, it's a, a quite a, a complex landscape uh, of, uh, uh, of enforcement actions that are themselves changing the way people do business. So I, I'm going to conclude by just uh, uh, leaving you with, with a few questions that, that come out of all of this. So we have this massive stuff happening, uh, huge changes in the way that the agencies operate, the rules that they're operating under. I, I think the one question is, is the system safer than it was before? And I think the answer to that is categorically yes, the system is safer than it was before, certainly the banking system. Uh, capital, liquidity are at much higher levels. The stability both of large individual banks and the overall system, I think, is, is, is clearly fortified. A second question, of course, is a, is a hot topic these days. Have we solved too big to fail? I think the answer to that will be we will know if we solve too big to fail the next time there's a big crisis and we figure out that whether we successfully closed a large institution or not. But there are rules in place, there are institutional arrangements in place to do that, and I think uh, without a doubt that the effort will be made uh, to deal with a large institution by closing it. The challenge becomes not is it possible to deal with a single institution, the challenge becomes if you have a widespread market crisis, how do you deal with that environment and those circumstances, runs, you know, kind of catastrophic, uh, catastrophic events take, uh, taking place. The third question is, is the system not just safe, but also sound and capable of providing the, the financial services that we're looking for? And I, I could well argue with that with the exception of the capital liquidity and some of the other basic safety and soundness rules, that much of the re remaining agenda does not really do all that much to address safety, uh, but it does challenge the ability of the, of the banks to do what they have done before. Now, uh, you know, we, we may not be worried that that new normal will be very different from what we started out with, but it will be quite a different new normal. Uh, and the question is, how will, uh, how will banks adapt to that? Uh, I'm not a particular, I'm not a proponent at all of the idea of, of simply breaking up the, the large institutions, but I think one of the problems we now face is that we're solving every problem two or three different ways. I mean, reference was made to this over lunch. I mean, we're going to reduce leverage and increase capital and increase liquidity and require more collateral and, and just come at it from many different directions, which makes it more challenging. And then finally, is the government setting the right incentives for financial stability, innovation, customer service, and other policy objectives? Um, we, we seem very focused at the moment on the incentives that government's creating, has created to encourage bigness in banks, but the government creates all sorts of incentives for the system all the time. I mean, it, it uh, 
some favor savings, some favor investment, uh, some favor sound banking, higher capital, but others I think have been more problematic. Uh, excessive emphasis on housing, fiscal and global imbalances. Uh, you could argue that we're encouraging way too much to be spent on education, although you may disagree with me on that one. Uh, but the, the present policy debate and supervision that focuses only on size, I think, is, is and, and treatment of customers, I think, is, is, uh, uh, is focusing a bit too narrowly. I mean, after all, the government did create the incentives that resulted in the $2 trillion banks. They didn't exist before the crisis. They did after the crisis, often with the encouragement of government to save those that were in weakest condition. So I think we need to think carefully about the incentives being created. Uh, and I'll now turn the floor over to uh, my fellows who will tell us whether we're getting this right or not. Thank you. All right. Okay. All right, good afternoon. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to talk about financial fragility and banking reform. I'm not going to stick to Doc Frank. We're going to talk more broadly about bank capital. And it's always interesting to me why all discussions of banking reform tend to occur in the aftermath of a crisis. We never <laughs> seem to discuss banking reform the way that textbooks prescribe, which is in a sensible, calm, rational manner. Now, recently, John Coffey, in a paper, uh, noted it's called The Political Economy of Dodd Frank. And he talks about why it's so difficult to talk about, to legislate any major banking reform unless we've had a crisis. And the reason is that it's very hard to put together the political coalitions that you need to make major changes. Uh, now, the popular view of what caused this crisis, and there's some disagreement. By the way, I have no, I have no idea who this person is. But it's somebody who's supposed to represent the popular view, is that uh, this crisis was caused by misaligned incentives, uh, financial institutions took um, too much risk because of de facto and de jure safety nets. Regulators were lax. They allowed uh, financial institutions to take excessive risk because there was a misalignment of incentives between regulators and taxpayers, and politicians didn't help. Joe Stiglitz uh, points out in his book, he asserts in his book that uh, Many politicians were overly eager to embrace uh, free markets and, and block regulation. That would have made a lot of sense. Now, Chester referred in his lunch talk to the uh, FCIC uh, report. And that reached a somewhat similar conclusion when they said that regulators saw warning signs, the crisis, but they deliberately chose uh, to ignore them and that especially the Fed was too supportive of industry growth objectives, and so they didn't put the brakes when they should have put the brakes on risk-taking and growth. Now, not everybody agrees with or endorses this, this point of view, and there's an interesting article by Andy Lowe at MIT. That is Andy Lowe, yeah. Uh, in the Journal of Economic Literature last year in which he reviews 21 books written on the financial crisis roughly half of them by academics and half by, by journalists. And he says, there are several observations to be made from the number and variety of narratives that the authors in this review have preferred. The most obvious is that there is still significant disagreement as to what the underlying causes of the crisis were, and even less agreement as to what to do about it. <clears throat> but what may be more disconcerting for most economists is the fact that we can't even agree on all the facts. Did CEOs take too much risk? Were they acting as they were incentivized to act? Was there too much leverage in the system? Did regulators do their job? Or was forbearance a significant factor? <clears throat> was the Fed's low interest rate policy responsible for the housing bubble? Or did other factors cause housing prices to skyrocket? Was liquidity the issue with respect to the runs on the repo market? Or was it more of a solvency issue among a handful of problem banks? I was at a one-day conference at meeting at the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland a few weeks ago. Uh, 
And there was a paper presented there which seemed to suggest very strongly that it was more a bank-specific solvency issue as opposed to a market-wide liquidity freeze. Uh, so there's a lot of disagreement on, on, on even the basic facts. Now, I would argue that misaligned incentives, which seems to be the most popular explanation, cannot be the whole story. And I have a recent working paper that's still being revised in which, which is called Skill, Luck, and Financial Crises, in which the basic argument is that the longer things go well, the higher is the confidence that we, and when I say we, I mean academics, regulators, bankers, financiers, rating agencies, everybody, develop in the ability of bankers to manage these risks. So if you're just a rational Bayesian updating person, uh, you, would, you would actually do this. And then as a result, of course, risk taking increases because it's not punitively priced given the improved risk assess uh, ability assessments. And, and so it keeps building and, and the financial sector keeps growing and more and more risk gets put on and off balance sheets of, of the balance sheets of financial institutions. And then if there are any events that trigger a change in beliefs about whether it's really the ability of banks uh, that determines outcomes or it's largely a matter of luck, uh, then you can get liquidity drying up and you can, get, you can get a crisis. And this shift in beliefs could be triggered by a whole host of things, including unexpected defaults in certain sectors. So while I agree with Andy Lowe that there is a lot of disagreement over the causes of the crisis, I think the emerging research points to a few things that, that we can probably agree on. Okay. So one is that high leverage, there's a number of papers now that make the point that high leverage among financial institutions not only makes individual financial institutions more risky and, and, and more fragile, but it also increases systemic risk. And in turn, because it increases systemic risk, it increases the need for bailouts. And once you recognize that the need, once financial institutions recognize that the probability of bailouts has gone up, of course, that has a perverse ex ante uh, incentive effect on these institutions to increase leverage and risk taking. Now, this is a point that's been made in a recent paper in the American Economic Review by Fari and Tirol. And I have a working paper with uh, Vera Lacharya that makes a somewhat related point. And we also argue that if you have more le highly le levered institutions, then the failure of one institution is actually more likely to trigger the uh, pressure put by creditors on other institutions. And so this can increase the cost of rollover funding, or it can result in rollover funding being cut off entirely in these institutions. And so at, even though you may have, even though you may view high leverage as a bank-specific issue, it actually introduces systemic risk through what we call capital-induced, uh, capital structure-induced contagion. So the more highly levered the institutions we have, the more likely it is that bank-specific problems can magnify uh, into systemic risk issues. And, and this is a particularly important issue when you think about what the right level of capital is for an individual institution is you need to worry not only about the risk of that institution, but the negative spillover effects through this sort of contagion on other institutions that may be holding correlated assets. Now, one of the messages that emerges from this is that while FSOC can help us improve our tracking of systemic risks, when you have high leverage, it can create systemic risks in very subtle ways. Uh, and these ways may not show up in the data. And all that you can do in FSOC is actually track the data uh, as these data get created. But there may be risks that don't get reflected in the data that FSOC tracks. And so systemic risk may be building up in the economy. And it may be too late by the time uh, it shows up in the data and, and you decide to intervene. So one of the messages coming out of this research is that we need higher capital requirements. And this is sort of a theme that we've heard earlier today. Uh, and by this, I mean equity capital as a percentage of assets, and not only risk-weighted assets, so as to avoid some of the gaming issues. Uh, 
And, and we need this not only to control bank-specific idiosyncratic risk, but also, also systemic risk. All right. Now, I, I made this point at a recent, con a recent conference in Europe. And this is a chart that my, my discussant put up. And, and the title of the chart that he put up was, Capital Regulation is Not a First Order Issue. And the point that he was making, and this is taken from a paper by Grop and Heider in a 2010 publication, is that if you look at the top 400 banks in the US and the European Union, uh, 1991 to 2004, prior to the crisis, that the majority of them were above the red line, which is the 4% uh, threshold. And therefore, this was not an issue of capital deficiency that, that drove the set of events that eventually culminated in the crisis. And I think graphs like this are highly misleading uh, because they make a number of assumptions, such as one, that we're measuring capital correctly, which in this, the way that it's measured in this graph is not the right way to do it. And the other is that somehow magically 4% is the right threshold. And I think there's increasing agreement now among a lot of people that that is way below the kinds of thresholds we should be thinking about if we think about calibration issues. It kind of reminds me of some of the papers that were being written before the crisis whose titles were, Why Are Banks Holding So Much Excess Capital? I haven't seen those papers since the crisis. But uh, now one of the arguments that people make when you when you propose higher capital requirements is that, and this is more an academic argument than a practitioner argument, is that, is that if you in introduce more capital into banks, it's somehow going to increase the safety of banks so much that it'll reduce the incentives of uninsured creditors to monitor these banks and therefore sacrifice market discipline, which is, has been sort of an important aspect of bank regulation, that we want to rely not just on regulatory discipline, but also the discipline imposed by markets. And if you put too much capital into banks, that somehow will reduce those, those incentives. So in deference to that argument, one of the uh, papers that I have uh, with Viral Acharya at NYU and Hamid Mehran, the New York Fed, uh, from our analysis emerges uh, a proposal that I want to describe to you, which is a way to get more capital into banking without disturbing any of the incentives that uninsured creditors might have to impose market discipline on, on banks. Um, and so think about the total capital of the bank being at the top and consisting of two components. Okay, the first component is what I call the normal capital account. Now, you know, this could be defined in one of, one of many different ways. It could be either tier one, it could be just a leverage ratio, it could be just equity, OK? Um, and then you have on the right an additional capital account, which I'm going to call a special capital account. It's equity as a percentage of total assets. And uh, I would include both on balance sheet and off balance sheet assets. Now, the key innovation here is that this special capital account belongs to the bank's shareholders as long as the bank is solvent. But if the bank has to be bailed out, then this capital doesn't accrue to the creditors. It actually belongs to the regulator. Now, the consequence of this is that as far as the bank's uninsured creditors are concerned, this capital is invisible to them because they can never get, as long as the bank is solvent, it doesn't matter. They're getting repaid, so it doesn't matter. But when the bank approaches insolvency, this capital is not available to them. So as far as they're concerned, it doesn't exist. On the other hand, because the shareholders have the possibility of losing this capital, conditional on default, they care very much about it. And so if we believe that more capital, more equity capital in the bank has a positive uh, influence in attenuating the bank's risk-taking incentives, then this is all of the benefits of capital in that sense, because the more capital you have in the special capital account, the more the shareholders have at risk, and therefore, the lower are their risk-taking incentives. So in a sense, it gives you the best of both worlds. It gives you equity discipline, because it puts uh, shareholders' money uh, at risk, so they have skin in the game. But on the other hand, it doesn't reduce the skin in the game that the uninsured creditors have. So they have as much incentive to monitor the bank. So this has positive ex ante uh, incentive effects if that's an important issue for us, and I believe it is. Uh, 
Now, here are some of the implementation details of how this would work. Is here's the bank. They have tier one capital which, and the special capital account. Uh, now, I'm going to talk about how you build up the special capital account. So I'm not suggesting, and I think John Griffin had a question earlier about, you know, how do you get these banks to raise so much equity uh, up front. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm proposing that all of the money that goes into the special capital account is built up through earnings retentions and dividend restrictions, as opposed to forcing banks to issue new equity. So you can have a phase-in requirement. Now, the tier one capital can be directly invested in anything that's permitted by the bank's charter. It can also be used to leverage the bank's balance sheet so that if the requirement is, let's say, 10 percent, then every dollar of normal capital is going to allow the bank to add ten dollars in, in assets. The special capital account has the same leverage uh, capability as a regular capital account, but the difference is that it can only be invested in some liquid instrument, for example, treasuries. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, uh, this, this doesn't address the issue Chester raised about if treasuries are going to be used as collateral for everything, we run out of enough securities. But this can only be directly invested in treasuries. And so if the bank's tier one capital declines because of negative earning shocks, then there would be a transfer from the special capital account to the, special, uh, to the normal capital account. And then <clears throat> you would impose the dividend restrictions to allow the special capital account to be built back up. Once it's back up to whatever the regulatory mandated level is, then you would lift the dividend restrictions and the bank can go back to paying dividends as it did before. Now, as I mentioned before, shareholders own this account in the good states. Regulators own this account if the bank is insolvent. We could make the SCA, the special capital account, countercyclical, uh, sort of in the spirit of uh, one of the components of Basel III. And so we would raise the capital ratio in good times uh, and, and build it up through retained earnings. Okay? So that's the basic idea of how one would implement this. Now, some of the benefits of this are that instead of asking banks to raise external equity, we could build up the special capital account through uh, earnings retentions and therefore through dividend restrictions. So there are no adverse selection costs uh, associated with having to raise equity, the usual costs that people refer to when they argue against raising, against asking banks to raise additional equity. There's also in this case no discretion for the regulators. So the, the trigger is absolutely mechanical. Every time you fall below the mandated regulatory level on the special capital account, there's an automatic mechanical transfer to the special account, and you put in place predetermined dividend restrictions. So there's no information being revealed by this, so you don't have the kinds of problems that you have with self-fulfilling prophecy kinds of issues with contingent capital, for example. It gives you the best of both uh, debt and equity discipline, because both shareholders and creditors uh, can have a lot of skin in the game. And because the special capital is invested in treasuries, it means we don't have to worry about the kinds of issues we worried about during, during the crisis, which is fire sales and downward asset price spirals. Uh, hopefully, there's enough liquidity in this market that that's not an issue. Uh, the counter-cyclicality of the special capital account also deals with sort of another issue that, that's been of concern to me, which is that, and this comes out of the paper on skill luck and crises that I mentioned earlier, which is that whenever times are good, risk-taking incentives inevitably go up. And the incentives that regulators have to put the brakes on risk-taking are also the weakest. When, when things are going well, I've talked to people within the Fed who said that they were sounding, the economists were sounding alarm bells before the crisis about some of the things that they saw, uh, saw in the financial system, but it was very hard politically to have uh, any talk of higher capital requirements or any restrictions because banks could show you they were doing really well. And so you had no proof to show that there were any problems or any risks that would justify uh, more stringent regulation. So, Putting in place a counter-cyclical special capital requirement deals with this, issue, with this issue as well. The purpose of the scheme is to deal not with what happens after the crisis, but it's really to deal with 
affecting the ex-ante probabilities of getting into the states that then eventually lead to a crisis. And then finally, uh, a couple of notes on some of the concerns that people have about what will happen to banks if we're going to ask them to hold 15% or 20% capital, whatever that number is. Uh, will it hurt the values of banks? Will it hurt their shareholder returns? Will it make it more difficult for them to raise, raise capital? And, and there are some interesting pieces of research that, uh, that, have, uh, 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 that have been published or in working paper form that sort of at least provide some indications that uh, these concerns may not, be, uh, may not be that relevant. There's a paper by Baker and Wergler which just came out on SSRN which basically shows that if you look at banks in the past 40 years in the US, the equity of better capitalized banks had both lower sy systematic risk and lower idiosyncratic risk than the equity of banks with lower amounts of capital. And they also show that these banks enjoyed higher rates of return for their shareholders. And this is sort of consistent with the paper that I published with Hamid Miran uh, a couple of years ago in the Review of Financial Studies in which we looked at the relationship between bank equity capital and, and value. Uh, we looked at both equity value, total value, and the cross-section, and we found that actually the better capitalized banks have higher value is controlling for a whole host of factors. So all of these pieces of research seem to be pointing to the fact that increasing capital in banking is not going to have anywhere close to the dire consequences that some people have predicted. Uh, and, and so the idea is that we can make both bank shareholders as well as taxpayers better off by, by increasing capital. Thank you. All right, well, thank you for inviting me. It's been an interesting uh, discussion so far. My remarks kind of might have made most sense as a rebuttal to Tom Honig. I agreed with a lot of what he said, but I have a, I'm one of Andy Lowe's guys that has a completely different take on the crisis, so I'm going to give you a, a different interpretation um, of, of what I think was uh, going on. And uh, I teach a whole course on the crisis, so I have like 30 hours of lectures on this stuff. This is like 10 minutes out of the, the last class. Um, all right, so what, what did Dodd-Frank uh, conclude was the problem to be fixed. If you'd read the 21 books that Andy Lowe surveyed, you could have had at least four themes as what we had to worry about. Um, I would say the, the premise for macroprudential regulation is something about the deleveraging that we saw afterwards in fire sales. Um, so that's one possibility. Uh, I'm going to talk a lot about runs in a second. And then Tom kind of focused on bailouts and too big to fail. And then there's the other, you know, 1,500 pages of Dodd-Frank that are about things that had nothing to do with the crisis. So it's um, not clear at all what exactly we were setting out to do. Um, if you want a good survey, we, we, we hired a guy at Booth to try to communicate our research a little bit more accurately. And the first thing he's produced is a summary of the 10 mutually inconsistent views that our faculty have about the crisis. And uh, he, he's got this nice survey article that uh, includes all kinds of different perspectives on this, but I, I kind of like two of these things, that we should limit the fraction of the claims that are runnable and remember Diamond and Dippig. Uh, it would be cute if we could actually get somebody to go pick at the New York Fed with those signs. All right, so here's, here's my spin on what the crisis was about. If you look at the spillovers into the economy and the things that Tr um, triggered a lot of the rescues and a lot of the extensions of the safety net. They came from things that were runs, but just not the, the kind that we're used to seeing. And, and so my, my biggest gripe with what um, Tom was proposing is, and it's widespread, I mean, the Vickers Commission and the way the UK is going in, embodies this perspective, which is we want to have this super safe public utility and then we're going to have a casino where anything goes. And it's like, how can you say that when we just watched five runs that would have been in the casino that we had to bail out last time, and it would be all the more crazy next time if those things are 
pushed out and we're told explicitly uh, the market discipline is all we're going to have. So let's think about this. We lost how many uh, hundreds of billions of funding in the asset-backed commercial paper market during the, the fall of 2007. So that was the first sign. It was a complete run. There's, there's multiple papers now showing that, that people uh, stopped rolling over this form of funding, that you control for all the fundamentals you can that are the characteristics of the assets being funded, and yet still um, there were just indiscriminate refusals to, to roll over funding. So that was the first stage. It didn't require the government to do anything, but it did put a lot of stress on the banking system because of all the backup lines of credit that flowed back into the banking system. Second one, um, tri-party repo. If you ask the people at the New York Fed why was Bear Stearns saved, they'll tell you uh, quite directly that if Bear Stearns had gone under the following Monday, um, Lehman, Merrill Lynch, Goldman, Morgan Stanley all would have faced nobody willing to buy their paper. And the one trillion dollars of funding that was, that was being rolled over every single day in that market would have disappeared and it would have been the end of the financial system as we knew it and we just weren't ready. Um, Bear, the last day of its life, couldn't repo its treasuries. Okay? Now that tells you that the infrastructure is deeply screwed up if nobody was willing to be a, a counterparty on treasury repo. Two other things that, that surfaced that were present in Bear but became much more visible in, um, in the Lehman bankruptcy was the ways through which prime brokers get, get funding that subject themselves to runs. And this is completely different than the stuff Tom was talking about. So the, the first way is all the, the kind of loopholes that exist in the way derivatives are treated. So by convention, uh, if you're a broker-dealer and you're repoing with, uh, if you've got a derivatives counterparty uh, contract with somebody, uh, it would be common for you not to have posted all the margin that you would have against that contract. It would be um, possible that you, you might not have um, you might not have uh, posted any margin if you have a good enough credit rating. That was basically AIG's game. They had a AAA credit rating that they were leveraging by uh, avoiding having to post any margin. And when they got downgraded, they had a $30 billion liquidity call that they couldn't meet. So the derivatives contracts, by convention, allow you to basically kind of suck up liquidity. Now, how does the run work? Well, the run works when your customer says, I'd rather face Goldman Sachs than you, and you novate the derivatives contract. You then have to margin up to hand it over to Goldman. And so every time your position weakens and somebody wants to step away and face another counterparty, when they do that, the funding that you were extracting by not fully margining has to be you know, uh, provided right on the spot. And of course, no institution in the middle of one of these bouts of doubt is going to say, well, I won't novate that contract because I need the liquidity. So they have to do it. You get a run there. The, the fourth one was prime brokerage. Um, Daryl Duffy has a, a nice calculation where he, he shows that in the week after Lehman, Morgan Stanley lost $80 billion of funding. Where did that $80 billion of funding uh, come from? I think he's got about 50 billion of it is customers pulling their accounts from Morgan Stanley. How does Morgan Stanley extract liquidity from prime brokerage? Well, there's a series of things that if you're the prime broker, you can do that allows you to fund positions based on the customer's securities that you're holding. So you might think a prime broker is a custodian. They kind of take the securities and they, they um, keep track of all the accounting that needs to be done with them. But there are a variety of ways that the uh, broker can hold on to those securities and use them for funding. So one thing they can do is if one customer wants a loan, they can make it themselves or they can take idle securities that are sitting in an account of another customer and loan those. They can um, take those securities and pledge the idle securities from the customer in a repo transaction because it's collateralized. Um, so those are two big ways that if a customer walks away from you, all of a sudden the funding that you were, you were getting from those securities have to be made up. Okay? So $50 billion in a week, that's what uh, Morgan Stanley lost. And you, Goldman lost a big runoff 
as well up until um, the Paulson intervention in, in October of 2008. So prime brokerage is just fundamentally vulnerable to this. Uh, you might say, well, we don't want to do that, but then if you decide that you're not going to do that, it means that you're going to have a lot of collateral trapped all throughout the financial system sitting there idly. So it wouldn't be free to necessarily do that. Finally, there was the money market mutual fund problems where we had to, you know, pass a blanket guarantee. It's well understood that money market mutual funds are basically a bank that holds no capital. Um, and we saw that they came under stress. So those are five runs. They have nothing to do with too big to fail. They have everything to do with maturity transformation. Uh, these things were at the center of the rescues. Throw AIG in there. I mean, I'd say that the three big ones that we saw, well, the non one with Lehman, the big one with Bayer, the big one with AIG, were all about this kind of stuff. Now, what does Dodd-Frank Dodd do about this? Um, essentially nothing on asset-backed commercial paper. That, that class of securities is dead. Uh, there's, there's a little bit of rules saying that you have to have some skin in the game if you securitize, but the ABCP is, is probably gone. Um, there's nothing on prime brokerage. There is a little bit of language saying that we have to make it easy to figure out who owns securities in the event you go under, but they didn't do anything like say we're going to have hard rules on segregation that say you can't use your customer funds for extracting liquidity. And that would be a hard conversation to have because we probably don't have a benchmark for what the social value of liquidity is or uh, of what uh, collateral, uh, collateral value and then the liquidity provision that goes with it is. So I don't know how to calibrate how much of this to allow, but there was no discussion of it. There was nothing in Dodd-Frank about the money market funds. The SEC took one set of actions to, to try to improve uh, the rules in 2010. You saw that an SEC chairman stepped down because she could not convince the rest of the SEC to go along with a reform that would have either put capital or floating NAV in there. Um, Mr. Honig was pushing for um, floating NAV. Uh, I would say I think floating NAV is a farce when it comes to money funds because most of the, the assets that they hold don't trade in anything like a liquid market. You tell me what the, the mark to market value of some General Motors 37 day commercial paper is. You already have money funds that are marking to market every day and you know what the values are? It's 1.0000, 15 zeros and a one or 0.9999999998. So these things are never going to float because there's no secondary market. It's not like an equity market. This is short term maturity transformation and you'd have to change all the accounting rules to do something about that. So I'm very skeptical if the SEC goes ahead with this floating NAV proposal that we won't find ourselves back into a problem again because if you get into crisis, there is no secondary market. You've got it marked at one. Indeed, the accounting rules allow you to market uh, at historical costs for anything that's under 60 days in maturity. So that's not going to work. Um, Tri-party repo, nothing in Dodd-Frank. The New York Fed uh, formed a working group at the end of the working group's uh, mandate, there's the conclusion that they wrote about the success of that working group. Now, subsequent to this, um, the New York Fed has kept pushing, and there may be some, some progress that's in the works, and they, they've, they've made enough progress to where at least some optimists think that by the end of next year, tri-party repo will be less vulnerable to runs. And then finally, on derivatives, I, I think, um, Dodd-Frank says a lot about derivatives. The only thing, though, it says about runs are the, the one-day stay on qualifying financial contracts. So in the new uh, Dodd-Frank resolution regime, what is envisioned is if, if uh, Lehman was to fail again, you'd have one day to decide, do you want to move all of their derivatives book to a bridge bank? Now, you think about what the incentives are for a run, if you saw that that was anywhere in the cards, what are you going to do? You're going to step out of the derivatives trade a month earlier than you would have before because who's going to want to get tangled up in that? So I think we've, we've arguably made the runs problem worse through Dodd-Frank. So I put this, you know, my takeaway on all this is that Dodd-Frank basically has this narrative, some of which is right, but a lot of which is just wrong. Uh, the remedies don't address what I see as the problems, and so most of what 
we're counting on is that the FSOC is going to step in and try to do stuff. The first example of this was the attempt to discipline the money market funds, and it was a complete failure. I mean, you had to have an SEC chairman leave. They had to basically say, we're going to drop the hammer on you, and they, they eventually are going to get something. But um, I think the, the situation we're in is, I agree we're somewhat safer with respect to a large number of risks, but there's a lot of maturity transformation that's still going on, and we essentially have the same bad choices if uh, something goes wrong. Thanks. I think we have uh, time for some questions um, for the panel. Yes, in the back row. Yeah, just continue with, with where Neil stopped off. One thing when you were talking about derivatives you didn't mention is the new clearinghouse requirements, which if they were completely effective, presumably would sharply reduce the risk of, of runs. What is your feeling about those? In principle, I think it's a very good idea. One of the things that I'm worried about is the proliferation of all these clearinghouses and how we're going to, in the short run, end up with so many of them that there's going to be very, very inefficient netting. Uh, so we may make that problem better for the medium term, but I think in the short run, what we're going to end up doing is having a lot more collateral sitting in all these clearing houses. You know, one in Singapore, one in Hong Kong, one in you know uh, Japan, another one in New York, another one in maybe Frankfurt or Paris, another one in in uh, London. You have six or seven clearing houses. That's not going to do most of what we would want it to do. It, it will help with this problem. The other thing is that the incentives for the um, institutions to keep doing stuff over the counter is so strong because of the profits that they're going to fight this so that it takes much longer than you would have imagined. So you, you don't think that we're going to end up with essentially one clearinghouse for each product? No. No, and, 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 you, and I don't even think you'd want to do that because you'd want, you'd certainly want at least currencies and interest rates uh, to be cleared in the same place because there's, there's so much duplication there. And then, you know, you'd want to have um, a lot of the biggest contracts all traded in a single place. I just don't think the political economy works to get you there. Anyone else in the panel? Yes. Uh, I'd like to ask, Neil, uh, what would you do about the general banking sector, since that's largely what you're focusing on, in terms of regulation and supervision? And do you think it poses more of a problem for the court than the, uh, the regulated uh, banking sector? Well, I, calibrating the levels are hard, but I mean, one of the problems we have is we have a bank. Uh, a Basel Committee on Bank Supervision. So you have a crisis, you have a committee, they all talk to each other, they know what to do, they get together, you get capital, you get liquidity, you get all kinds of stress tests, you get a whole bunch of stuff, all hitting on that part of the problem, all of which have the incentive to move stuff into the casino. The, the biggest problem for the shadow banking um, system is just the form of the shadow banking system is different in every single jurisdiction. I think of the shadow banking system as regulatory arbitrage. And since the rules start out differently everywhere, the way you arbitrage the system looks different in the UK and Canada and the US. So if you wanted to have a Basel committee on shadow <coughs> banking, you'd be sending insurance regulators from some places, money funds here, um, you know, non-bank banks there. And then they'd get together and you'd have the problem that they don't speak the same language. So solving this problem is going to be difficult. I think some of the things that you could think about doing are paying more attention to repo and trying to do something on, on margins and haircuts because the way much of this stuff ends up getting funded is through repo. And so you know, no more um, AAA exemptions that say you have like five basis points of haircuts and stuff like that. I think that would be a good thing. If we got clearing houses um, for, for some of these things, that, that, that would be desirable. But I, I think the shadow banking system is, in the US case, the biggest problem uh, that, that we face. And it's not like there's a, a playbook you can take down to easily fix it. 
Jennifer. I have a question for John. So you had a slide where you went through various estimated costs to the industry from some of the regulation, like the Volcker rule, the derivatives rules. So how would you suggest that a regulator approach considering these costs in relation to benefits if that can be difficult to measure, like reductions in systemic risk? Right. Uh, you know, the, the fact is the securities regulators face the particular challenge of actually having to do cost-benefit analysis and can be challenged on it. The bank regulators, I was always glad, did not have to do that. Uh, you could uh, assert, I mean, I think in fact, Dodd-Frank says the cost of a crisis is so horrific that whatever price we pay to put these regulations in place is worth it, so put the regulations in place. I, I mean, the, the cost benefit that's done is, is not meaningful in, in any sense of the term. It's kind of looking for the least cost way to do something, can you compare one approach to another and find a slightly lower cost way to do it? But in fact, on the on the banking side of things, it's it's uh, uh, kind of an assertion that uh, that the, the benefits will outweigh the cost. Although actually, McKinsey's been doing some work with with some clients trying to get a better feel uh, for actually with the government clients trying to get a better feel for how to, to do that kind of analysis. So I, I mean, I think it's something where more work is needed. You think do you think uh, Volcker on net is the benefits outweigh the cost? Well, if you tell me what Volcker will be when it's all finished, <laughs> well, <exactly. laughs> the cost gets a count of two years of and billions of hours of manpower. I don't know what the benefits are. Yeah, no, I, I'm I'm not a. I, I used to work for Paul Volcker, but I'm not a great <laughs> fan of the of the of the Volcker rule as much as anything because it's practically impossible to define. And just following up on that, uh, we've seen some of the rules, particularly at the SEC and at, now at the CFTC, challenged uh, through the legal system. Do you have any predictions on which rules may be most vulnerable to challenge going forward? I, I don't. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah, so I, mean, I agree with Neil about sh the shadow banking system, but it seems that the shadow banking system kind of was used by the large complex institutions, the large banks and investment banks to really avoid kind of capital requirements, right? So it's sort of, it was, you know, I don't think you can separate the two, you know, the two out. So not, not that I'm a fan of Thought Frank, but you could argue that parts of Thought Frank are trying to address the behavior of large complex firms, so to that extent. But that they're putting all the incentives to just do more of it. If you make it 50 times more costly, it used to be to be a bank, and the banks used to do crazy amounts of regulatory arbitrage before, what are you going to get afterwards? More. <laughs> but it did, I mean, it did have the effect of pulling, I mean, things that were done through all sorts of off-balance sheet gimmicks and yeah. things have been sort of forced inside the, the net, which I think does help. I mean, I think you're taking Doug Frank literally, right? Because you're, but it, the, you know, they're regulating those institutions, I'm not saying they'll do it well, but they're regulating them uh, more than they were before, right? I mean, that's the, uh, I mean, it's not like a hedge fund. The question is whether, you know, something complete outside the regulatory framework is going to emerge, but at least within the regulatory framework, you know, which is it, the surprising right. thing about the crisis is the hedge funds came and went, and it wasn't a big deal. It's the guys doing maturity transformation that no, I, I blow agree. it up. No, I agree with that. All I'm saying is, is, you know, one could argue that Dodd Frank is doing tighter regulation on those guys mm -hmm. than they were previously, whether it's in Bruce's area, or whether it's in uh, off balance sheet, or or just generally, they have the purview to. To look more deeply up. Okay, are there anything on this side of the room? Yes. I, just to follow up on that, I mean, I, I find the origin quite compelling, but then it begs the question how would you propose to do with the shadow banking system? Well, I mean, I, I would try, I would, okay, so why did I say repo? Repo's overnight funding, and it's supporting something that's longer. So I would just be going around making heat maps of where maturity transformation is occurring and then try to think about, okay, well, what can we do here? Is there anything we can do? But when we cross jurisdictions? Maybe. I but mean, it just seems to me that would be an obvious push it across the, the legal boundary and see what happens. I mean, 
I mean, I don't know. Just because it's hard doesn't mean we shouldn't work on it. I mean, I, I, I think we, we need to. I don't have an answer, by the way. No, I, I, I don't think I'm you have, curious I haven't there. run into anybody that's got a great answer about this. But I mean, you could, if you want to go extreme, I mean, you, you could say that you basically want a capital requirement for like every funding transaction. So you could go to something that approximates asset level capital charges so that no matter how it ends up getting funded, there's some equity tranche that's loss absorbing that, that moves with the asset. That would be like uh, revolution. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, I've kind of pondered this a little bit. I mean, I'm always coming back to the idea that it's going to be really hard to kind of nail down the spot where you're going to be regulated. <laughs> I mean, I. But it, it does seem to me like you might have thought rather than an FSOC that just kind of does this, you'd have somebody that would be, you know, the maturity transformation regulator well, that, that would be out there looking for this. I mean, well, I, that's what I say. I, I agree. I think that's compelling. That's a fundamental problem. I just don't know. I mean, FSOC is at least intended and the Office of Financial Research to yeah. do the heat mapping. Uh, I mean, and then if you find that there are hot spots, what do you do? I mean, there's a question of whether FSOC has any capability uh, to, to do anything about it, but at least identifying the, the, the hot spots is, is part of the, pro the proposal. Okay, let's see. Okay. Back corner. Um, so I have a question for Anjan, and, and that is, I'm curious as to how your proposal for special capital compares to contingent equity. I mean, one way of looking at it is it's a little bit like contingent equity, but doing it um, through a, a bifurcation of how we look at, at capital. Is, is your approach better than contingent equity? Is it complementary? How, how do the two relate to each other? Yeah, so it is different from contingent equity. It's, in fact, non-contingent equity, right? The equity is always right. there. It's not something... So it's not a convertible, right? So it is equity in the sense that it's always there. The difference between that and normal equity is in the control rights and how the transfer contingent on insolvency, right? So with normal equity, you know, it's it's basically if the if the bank is in trouble, you know, everything just goes to when the value of the bank falls below its liabilities, everything just accrues to the creditors. Uh, here, because it's the special capital account that's invested in a designated asset like treasuries, you can actually keep track of it. The idea is that you don't want to make that available to the creditors because you don't, don't want to dilute their incentives to impose market discipline on the bank. So this notion that you know, s and and Moody's and major, rate, major rating agencies have noted that they give a two to three notches ratings advantage to banks because of the implicit bailout guarantee that's embedded, implicit or explicit, that's embedded in too big to fail and other forms of protection. And that's obviously something that makes leverage very attractive for banks because why would I take equity if I can get uh, price advantage to unsecured debt? And so that's the issue that this is trying to address, saying, look, we want this equity to be invisible to the creditors, but at the same time, we want it to be meaningful enough to provide all of the risk attenuation incentives for the shareholders, the banks. So you're trying to sort of get the best of both worlds. The other way in which it's different is that there is no conversion trigger, there's no regulatory discretion about when to convert something into equity. It's always equity. Is, is your assumption that if, when you talk about creditors monitoring, it's primarily bondholders that you have in mind. So it's yeah, the it's, same it's creditors. basically the sub sub debt holders. Yeah. Okay. Well, last question, and then we'll continue this. Maybe. I, I just uh, I continue. Uh, Mark, uh, uh, Charlie Thomas would be yes yeah. tomorrow. Uh, is there any difference when you mention the trigger? My understanding is he says the size of the market value of, of the equity, and there is no regulatory discretion. That it's the market value of equity, and that will trigger at certain points the conversion. Uh, so if you're trying to eliminate the regulatory discretion, so in that sense, I think it's more simple yeah. what you're proposing. Yeah, so what, you know, there isn't one, so there are like many versions of yeah
proposal, so there isn't one. Uh, the other thing is that these things become endogenous, right? So market value is not independent of where you set the threshold for the trigger. So the question is, you know, that's where you get these multiple equilibria because anticipation of the trigger affects the market value, the market yeah, but the, value. But I then, think it, you know, it's more fair trigger. to compare it to the Swiss. The things that have actually been right. issued are much more like yours. I mean, the Swiss ones trigger off the capital ratios, so it's right. got the same trigger as yours. Right. Effectively, and you want to remove the discretion of this, and the market seems to be willing to tolerate that. All right. Well, let's thank our panelists and. Uh,